An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 6, June 10th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in our last session we discussed the problem of the supposed intellectualism of the dialectic, or what was once described as panlogism. And today I think I can draw out some further implications of that discussion, which may help you to form a more definite conception of dialectic, and indeed to correct the idea of dialectic with which most of you will probably approach dialectical philosophy from the start. I would not wish to seem presumptuous here, but I imagine that most of you, insofar as you are not already professional philosophers, as people love to put it, will have this initial rather than rather automatic reaction to the dialectic. Well, dialectic is surely a matter of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Now, now, I will not say that these concepts are completely irrelevant here, or that they have absolutely nothing to do with the dialectic. But as far as, he, as these concepts are concerned, we must remember what dialectical theory itself has already insisted upon. Namely, that all propositions in abstracto, such as the truth, consists in thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, possess no truth unless and until they are unfolded and developed. I would go further and claim we commit no great sin against the spirit of dialectic if we say that, as soon as such concepts are rigidly fixed, as soon as they are turned into a sort of manual for thinking dialectically, they become the opposite of what Hegel intended them to be. And indeed, I can appeal directly to Hegel himself here for this qualification regarding the significance of what is often called the triadic schema, namely the three-step movement of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, is already expressed in the phenomenology of spirit itself, and indeed in words which will be able to take us much further. Hegel writes, of course, the triadic form must not be regarded as scientific when it is reduced to a lifeless schema, a mere shadow, and when scientific organization is degraded into a table of terms. Kant rediscovered this triadic form by instinct, but in his work it was still lifeless and uncomprehended. Since then it has, however, been raised to its absolute significance and with it the true form in its true content has been presented, so that the concept of science has emerged. I had already drawn your attention to this passage last time, and I would like to add a second formulation which may serve as a warning light against a particularly dubious use of dialectic. When this triadic schema is manipulated to produce the opposite of truth. Thus, Hegel continues, the knack of this kind of wisdom is as quickly learned as it is easy to practice. Once familiar, the repetition of it becomes as insufferable as the repletion of a conjuring trick already seen through. The thought here, therefore, is that even a method which is recognized in abstracto as the most advanced method of thought only produces falsehood when it is mechanically applied. That is, if the facts are simply subsumed under the method. If our experience or insight into the facts themselves fails to interrupt this subsumptive procedure. Paradoxically, we could say that the moment that dialectic becomes a kind of device or a recipe when it is manipulated as a method, then it is inevitably converted into, tr into untruth. And indeed, in the strictly dialectical sense, that it thereby comes into contradiction with its own concept. For to think dialectically is precisely to think through rupture, to think in such a way that the concept is emphatically brought to criticize itself in terms of what it attempts to cover, while the merely factical is measured in turn against its own concept. And the moment we retreat from this approach, when we no longer undertake what is described in another passage as the labor and the exertion of the concept, the moment we believe we have the method securely at our disposal, then the method has already been falsified and distorted. And actually, this is also a much more general experience as we can discover again and again in the context of art. 
Kandinsky once formulated the same insight beautifully in his book on the spiritual in art when he said that the moment an artist believes he has found himself, has finally discovered his style, then he has generally already, already lost it. Here again you have a sense of the atmosphere of dialectical thought, something which is very important, for it involves a concrete sense of its opposition to the need for security about which I have already spoken to you. It is one of the challenges of dialectical thought, and not perhaps the least, that in thinking dialectically we must avoid thinking like a certain kind of Kantian schoolmaster. Now I have the method, and once I have this, then nothing can surprise me anymore. Hegel vigorously rejected precisely this idea of method, where we can just carry on blindly and automatically, as it were, instead of undertaking the labor of thought itself at each and every moment. But these are actually relatively modest and straightforward insights, although it is really far more difficult to observe these insights in one's actual concrete thought than it is to entertain them in general terms. There is no guarantee, even when we try and think dialectically, that dialectical thought cannot fall into the embarrassing repetition of the conjuring trick with Hegel's which Hegel so vividly warns us against. And it is certainly most important as a thinking individual resolutely to resist any mechanical application of one's own categories. In other words, to reflect constantly upon these categories, to examine whether they are still indeed appropriate to the things which are being thought under them. What is so impressive about Hegel in this connection and what I particularly wish to bring home to you here is that he does not merely content himself with identifying and polemically repudiating this mechanical application and ossification of dialectical thought, but rather, as he invariably does with all other negative elements, Hegel also strives to grasp this specific phen phenomenon itself, attempts to derive even this aberration of thought, this reification and rigidification of thought from out of the living process of thought itself. And this is entirely characteristic of dialectical thought generally, for the vital nerve of the dialectic is precisely to resolve all that is rigid, reified, ossified. But it does so not by simply confronting all that with all that with what is allegedly vital and immediate, but rather by making use of what has become hardened, recognizing what is sedimented here, the congealed life and labor as it were. Thus, it only overcomes what has become rigid and ossified by allowing it to move by virtue of its own power, of the life that has been precipitated in the things and concepts which confront us in an alienated form. What is excellent, however, not only cannot escape the fate of being deprived of life and spirit in this way, of being flayed and then seeing its skin wrapped around a lifeless knowledge and its conceit. Here you can also feel something of the power of Hegel's language although he has generally been deemed a poor stylist, as they say, in comparison with the allegedly excellent stylist Schopenhauer. And this is obviously because those who have more or less unjustly assumed the role of judges where, where linguistic ability is concerned, imagine they can assess the language of philosophers by how far it directly accords with healthy common sense and ordinary spoken language, which is certainly not the case in Hegel. The power of his language lies rather in a remarkable kind of second immediacy or sensuous vividness, for in the impressive conceptual architecture of Hegel's thought, the concepts themselves are felt with such inner life, unfold so intensively and dynamically, that although they seem entirely abstract, they nonetheless reassume all the color and fullness of life within themselves, and thus in this remarkable way also begin in sparkle. I do not think a genuine analysis of Hegel's language has ever really been undertaken. Such an examination of his philosophical language would not only be welcome in itself, but could also illuminate the very deepest recesses of the philosophical content in Hegel. In a sentence like the one just quoted, you actually find the essence of Hegel, where the idea of the bare skin from which the life has fled is directly applied to something as seemingly abstract as knowledge and consciousness. I have already spoken in our last session about Hegel's philosophy as a rather remarkable field of tensions, 
where the movement lies not in continuous transitions, but in a tremendous exchange of energy, where thought leaps over from the pole of concretion to the pole of abstraction. In this way, we pass from what is closest to us, what is most sensuous, to precisely what is most remote. Instead of producing some middle term or connection between both, we see how the universal and the particular, the two extremes, touch. And again, this is profoundly bound up with the very content of Hegel's philosophy, for it is indeed the essence of dialectical teaching that the universal is also always the particular and the particular the universal. Thus, you can see how much the content of this philosophy has entered here into the boldness of such language. And in this context, I might point out, for those of you who have studied German poetry in particular, that this approach to language may also help to shed entirely new light on the poetry of Holderlin in a way that has perhaps never seriously been considered before. Hegel continues. Rather, we recognize even in this fate that people believe that already they already possess the matter itself in the dead skin, the power that the excellent exercises over the heart, if not over the minds of individuals, as well as the constructive unfolding into universality and determinateness of form in which its perfection consists, and which alone makes it possible for this universality to be used in a superficial way. <clears throat> Hegel is saying something extremely profound here, namely that thought itself must assume such a specific objective form of presentation if it is to relinquish all merely arbitrary claims and contingent expressions of subjectivity, but precisely in assuming this kind of universality, this determinate conceptual form, it also inevitably courts the danger of becoming a recipe of being reified and misused. In other words, the misuse which Hegel warns us about, the superficial application of the triadic schema, is by no means external to thought, for it is produced precisely when thought itself does what it must, if it is to rise above the merely arbitrary hic a nunce, if it is to become an objective truth. In other words, the untruth that arises from such rigidification is inseparable from the objectiva objectivation which belongs to truth itself. We cannot have one without having the other. This is one of the most important dialectical principles there is. Thus, one cannot acknowledge the power, the objectivity, the binding character of truth without thereby constantly exposing thought to the danger of simply becoming independent as such of forcing itself externally upon the matter itself, of being utilized in a blunt and mechanical fashion. In this warning against the mechanical use of dialectic, you have an exemplary case of dialectical thinking itself. For the vital nerve of dialectic can be recognized right here. Truth and untruth are not external to one another, are not simply opposed to one another as an abstract antithesis. Rather, the passage into untruth inhabits truth itself as its fate, as its curse, as the mark of the context of guilt in which it stands, and likewise the path which truth itself traverses, and truth is indeed a process, is solely a path through untruth. You can see, therefore, how dialectical thought responds even to such a warning against its own misuse. This warning against the misuse of the triadic schema involves an insight which perhaps should not be forgotten as another fundamental insight of dialectical thought. This is the idea, which just gives a slightly different twist to what we have been saying, that there is no thought which cannot also become false as soon as we isolate it. An abstractness for Hegel is always a matter of isolating something and detaching it from the context of the whole. Hegel showed as much in the passage which I have tried to interpret for you, where he alludes to the idea of the world process as a kind of divine play. He says that, while well, this may be true in itself, it sinks into untruth, that is, into insipidity, insip insipidity and indifference. If we fail to pursue this process itself in detail, I think we can go much further here and say there is no truth whatsoever, not even the truest theory, or even the theory of dialectic itself, 
which cannot also immediately become untrue if it is torn from its context, and especially if it is made to serve particular interests. There is nothing in the world, not the highest creations of philosophy or even the highest creations of art, which cannot be misused by clinging to them in isolation, and thereby holding people back from other things, deceiving people about other possibilities, generating false and untrue satisfactions, or creating spurious satisfactions. And if you expect me to suggest a practical application of dialectic here, it would be precisely this. Dialectical thought is extraordinarily mistrustful of any attempt to isolate and thus misuse thought. If any particular aspect of knowledge, any finite instance of knowledge, and any specific knowledge regarding the whole is always a particular instance of knowledge, acts as if it were the whole, is posited as, abs as absolute, it can readily enter the service of untruth and become an ideology. You can observe this most strikingly, of course, throughout the Eastern Bloc, where the dialectic has been elevated to a kind of state religion. Although an honest and genuine attempt has perhaps occasionally been made there to render certain aspects of dialectical theory intelligible to people, the dialectic has long since functioned as a religion of the state to justify a praxis which only perpetuates the repression which the impulse of dialectic inspires us to challenge. But I would merely say that we should not draw the opposite conclusion that dialectic is untrue, simply because such nonsense has been produced in the name of dialectic. For the dialectic shares with everything which has appeared as truth in history, and certainly with the truth which is embodied in Christianity, that it has been misused for every violent or shameful deed and for every kind of torture. I think it is a dangerous delusion to imagine that the Gelematius, commonly known as Diamat, could actually tell us anything valuable about dialectical theory itself. But here I should like to return to the question of the relative irre irrelevance of the triadic schema. You will easily be able to grasp this relative irrelevance after what I have said so far, if you remember that the dialectic is not actually method in the traditional sense. Although I realize that this is not what Hegel himself literally says at this point, I believe this claim can, be, can indeed be defended in the spirit of Hegelian philosophy. What I mean is that the dialectic is not a mere procedure through which mind firmly secures its objective character. For the movement of dialectic is always also supposed to be at once a movement of the matter itself and a movement of thought. But if that is so, if the dialectical movement is a movement of the matter itself and can be accomplished by reference to the matter itself, then it springs from this that any form of dialectical reflection which is purely methodological, i.e. is externally foisted upon things, already violates the character of dialectic. This will perhaps become clearer to you if you grasp precisely why the usual conception of the dialectic <clears throat> as a game of thesis, antithesis and synthesis, is so absurd and superficial. When the pre-philosophical consciousness hears of dialectic and of thesis, antithesis, and, and synthesis, it thinks something like this. Well, you start by setting up some proposition or other, then you introduce another proposition, which is the opposite of the first, but there is some truth to, to both of them, so then you have the synthesis. The so-called synthesis emerges once you have exhausted the framework of the two mutually opposed propositions with which you began. I will not simply assume that you feel quite the same aversion towards the concept of synthesis that I have strongly experienced since my early youth. But the way all this is presented here is certainly entirely misleading, for the dialectical movement does not arise by taking an initial proposition and externally supplementing it with the opposed proposition. It arises when the contradictory moment is discovered in the proposition originally expressed, when it is shown that the proposition which initially presents itself to you in a fixed and congealed form as a field of internal tension exhibits a particular kind of life within itself, so that the task of philosophy is in a sense to reconstruct this life within the original proposition. The synthesis 
The synthesis cannot therefore be understood as the extraction of the common element in the two earlier propositions. Indeed, Hegel specifically describes the synthesis as the opposite of this, namely as a further negation, as the negation of the negation. Thus, the antithesis, the opposite of the original proposition, which is spun from this latter, is qualified in itself as a finite proposition, as untrue in turn. And insofar as its untruth is further determined, the truth moment in the proposition which was originally negated thus reasserts itself. And the very essence of dialectical thought lies in the contrast between this kind of thinking, as I have here been describing it to you, and the purely abstractive kind of thinking preoccupied with logical extension of its concepts, which posits oppositions externally and then regards the common feature abstracted from both terms of the opposition as the result. That the triadic schema is not terribly important after all springs precisely from the fact that this schema is merely the subjectively abstracted process, a description of the subjective comportment with which we approach the matter itself, while this subjective comportment for its, for its part is only one moment which Hegel then corrects through another, which is described as a process of simply looking on, and this is the process of abandoning oneself entirely and unreservedly to the matter itself. I am well aware that these rather formal considerations which we have just been talking about will hardly be able to justify you in this form, or to satisfy you in this form, and I expect that you will naturally raise an objection which, as I can vividly recall, occurred to me too on my first encounter with dialectical philosophy. Why must everything really be a matter of contradictions? Are there really only contradictions everywhere? Aren't there also just simple differences? It is not simply an arbitrary decision, and here we face the serious suspicion that concepts can easily become a straitjacket. Is it not simply a violent attempt to contain or restrict reality by means of method if we try and interpret everything that exists in terms of contradiction? In terms of internal contradiction, admittedly, but still a form of contradiction, whereas there is just an abundance of disparate qualities, as different from another as green and red and blue. And if we consider the beauty of the full range of colors, for example, with the attempt to read everything, part two, as a form of contradiction, not basically involve a process of leveling, specifically of abstraction and homogenization. This objection has often been raised in the history of philosophy, of course, and I think it would be a very bad idea if we simply tried to settle it with an elegant gesture rather than, rather than confronting it. The objection was first specifically formulated and in a very acute manner from the, per ow, from the perspective of traditional Aristotelian logic, namely, God damn it. namely by the Aristotelian philosopher Trendelenburg, who made this the basis of his general critique of Hegel in the first half of the 19th century. And the objection was taken up again in a quite different form at the beginning of the so-called Hegel Renaissance in Benedetto Croce's book on Hegel. This book can be said to have initiated the said Renaissance, although in fact Croce approached Hegel with a slightly bad conscience for rather like Trend Trendelenburg, he actually wanted to bring Hegel closer in a certain way to positivistic stands of thought or strands of thought to what had formerly been described the philosophy of reflection. Thus the rebirth of interest in Hegelian philosophy, which was begun by Croce, remained somewhat problematic from the start. Now, in order to put all of this into its proper context and perspective, I should probably also say something about what seems to me the most appropriate way for thought to proceed in general. For I would argue that it is certainly not the task of thought to try and bring everything that exists under one common denominator. Indeed, the need to do so has itself been challenged by the dialectic. And since in this regard, we might also say the dialectic has recognized the naivety the naivety of 
a philosophy which imagines it could possibly capture the full riches of experience in some sort of butterfly net. It might be said that dialectic has, in a sense, already reached the point where we can also raise very significant objections to dialectic itself. If the dialectic were, in fact, merely the kind of reductive thinking which tried to bring all actual differences under the formula of contra contradiction, then it would actually be equivalent to the attempt to explain everything by appeal to a single fundamental principle, the very thing which the dialectic repudiated in the first place. I believe that the role which dialectical thinking has to play, the significance which attaches to dialectical thought or philosophical thought in general, is to act as a kind of discipline or counterforce in relation to living experience. In a sense, therefore, we really think dialectically when we also specifically limit ourselves. For if we perceive only differences, if we are aware only of variety without discovering any unity in this difference and variety, we cannot perceive the contradictory character which is concealed in all this variety. For then thinking threatens, in a sense, to dissolve, to forfeit its own theoretical form, and while we cannot turn theory itself into an absolute, we cannot have anything resembling knowledge without theory either. There is a paradoxical relationship here. If theory imagines that it has the whole within its grasp, that it is itself the key by which to explain everything, it has already fallen victim to the worst kind of hubris. Yet if thought entirely lacks this theoretical moment, this aspect of unification and objectivation, then we are basically no longer talking about knowledge at all, and we have effectively resigned ourselves simply to registering a more or less external, disparate and disorganized multiplicity of data. And it is precisely the need to work against this without doing too much violence to the things themselves, which underlies the specifically dialectical approach. But this way of putting it is still rather unsatisfactory, for now you may say, while you are introducing the dialectic simply as a sort of cure for the soul or for the concept, because it is healthy and advantageous for thought to have a method like this, something reliable to hold on to, although you do not really believe in it yourself and actually maintain there is no such thing as the absolute. And in fact, I feel at this point that I am obliged to say something decisive about dialectical method and the concept of contradiction. The concept of contradiction is no more to be hypostasized than any other concept. That is to say, it is no more the key to the dialectic than any other particular concept. And that is because the dialectic actually consists solely in the relation of concepts to one another, rather than in some absolute dignity bestowed upon any single concept. But you still have a right to know why the concept of contradiction does indeed play a central role in the dialectic and for what substantive rather than merely ancillary reasons this is the case. Thus I would begin by pointing out that, insofar as every finite judgment, by virtue of its form as a judgment, by virtue of affirming A is B, already claims to be an absolute truth, to be the truth itself, it comes into conflict with its own finite character with the fact that no finite judgment, precisely as finite, can be the whole truth as such. And if the concept of contradiction plays such a conspicuous role in the dialectic, if it is the concept which expects so much from the process of simply looking on, of giving ourselves over to the things themselves, if it is specifically described in the context of dialectic as the moving principle, then the reasons for this are to be found precisely here. The category of contradiction, or the origin of the modern doctrine of dialectic, derives in fact from the critique of pure reason, and, if you wish, to understand more fully the theme of these lectures, which we have broached but not completely developed today, you would do well to take a closer look at what Kant calls the transcendental dialectic, either in the original itself or by means of one of the re reliable secondary discussions of this text. The basic thought here is that as soon as we try and extend the fundamental concepts of our reason, what are called our categories, beyond the possibilities of our experience, beyond the possibilities of sensible intuition, or in other words, when we try and formulate infinite judgments, then we inevitably run the danger of positing mutually contradictory judgments, each of which seems to be equally convincing. 
such as the claim everything that happens has a first beginning in time, or the claim everything that happens in time involves an infinite series. And we can make analogous claims with regard to space, or again, everything that exists is subject to the law of causality, or again, there's also a causality of freedom, i.e. there's a point where the causal series is suspended. All of these mutually contradictory propositions arise when our categories, which in Kant's view, function solely to organize our experience, begin to run riot, as it were, to operate simply in a void, thereby claiming to possess an absolute truth through their own resources while they are actually valid only in relation to the phenomena with which they are confronted. Kant thus introduced the idea of contradictoriness into the context of knowledge in a new and indeed particularly emphatic way, for he argued that human reason inevitably becomes entangled in such contradictions. Since we cannot help but pursue our thought to the utmost, since the tendency to transcend the limits of fin finitude is also inscribed in the structure of our thought, we are constantly tempted to formulate such problematic propositions, and the fact that we can come to understand why these contradictions arise, and thus in a sense resolve them, does not really help us that much, as Kant himself points out in the Critique of Pure Reason. And then with Hegel, you may introduce a simple operation and argue as follows. If you tell us these contradictions are necessary contradictions which our facu faculty of knowledge is quite unable to avoid, contradictions therefore in which we constantly find ourselves entangled, and if your own supposed resolution of these contradictions does not ultimately help us, why not actually follow this path to the end? Why not explore these unavoidable contradictions more closely? Why not expose yourself to these contradictions which you claim are unavoidable? In short, why not try and reach the truth precisely through the movement of these contradictions? And this challenge which Hegel raises is indeed based upon an essential epistemological modification of Kant's philosophical position, namely upon the fact that Hegel no longer accepts the tried Kantian opposition between sensibility and the understanding, between thought and experience. And the way this is somewhat naively and drastically insisted upon by Kant, for Hegel says that I basically cannot know how I can then arrive at something like sensibility at all, that there is nothing sensuous, which is not itself mediated by the understanding, and vice versa, and therefore that this whole rigid separation between sensibility and the understanding, upon which the Kantian doctrine of the antinomies is based, and which can, in a sense, protect me from becoming entangled in, contra in contradictions, cannot ultimately be sustained at all. And that is precisely because there simply, there simply is no sensibility without the understanding, and no understanding without sensibility. And thus this movement of contradiction, which Kant regards merely as a malfunctioning on the part of consciousness, is actually one of the accomplishments, necessarily prompted by the essence of spirit. And that is precisely why thought essentially moves and develops in and through contradictions.